Thank you very much. I'll just add a little addition to uh, that um, resume. Uh, it's actually my last official duty with a field fresh shirt on. I, uh, I resigned from there uh, and finished up during May. However, I'm doing this as a, as a field fresh employee. So, um, I also would like to add that uh, I'm doing this from an onion point of view, field fresh and onion exporting business. And uh, actually onions sit outside Osveg in terms of peak industry body. So, I'll run through a little bit about Field Fresh's background and their business in Japan. Uh, Japanese culture, as I have seen it, uh, especially in comparison to other places in the world to export to, their technical expectations and their supply expectations. I've got some pictures of packing and marketing in Japan, a product, and then we'll conclude the summary. Field Fresh Tasmania is one of the operating divisions of West Webster Limited. Webster is the fourth oldest company in Australia, um, and the third uh, is one of those older ones not longer operating, so uh, the third oldest operating company, um, established in the late 1800s, originally as a wool marketing business. They're Stock exchange listed, you can buy shares today, quite actively traded in the last recent times. Today there are two operating divisions, Field Fresh Tasmania, who do onions, and Walnuts Australia. Walnuts Australia uh, is, uh, although the business is based in Forth in Northern Tasmania, Walnuts Australia has two operating sites, one on the east coast of Tasmania, about 550 hectares of owned orchards and a further 1,400 hectares of owned and about 300 hectares of managed orchards in the Riverina in uh, New South Wales and a further 1,000 hectares being currently developed. So walnuts are a very, very significant part of the Webster Group these days and have been very heavily invested in. Walnuts Australia don't currently export to Japan because of uh, market access difficulties with in-shell product. However, they've just installed a new cracking plant and expect to start in the next 12 to 18 months <coughs> cracked product going in. So that is one of the problems with Japan, like many overseas market, is market access. So there is no market access for in-shell nuts. Field Fresh was actually formed in 1998. Um, at that time, an onion operation set up by a guy called Peter Gillam, who was the forerunner of production of vegetables in Tasmania, uh, ran into financial difficulties with his VCOM business, and Field Fresh was formed by a, a number of other businesses coming together on that site. Webster was one of those businesses, and over the next few years, they slowly amalgamated the others under their own banner. So Field Fresh was actually formed in 98, but goes back in history a lot longer than that. Um, it's also been known Webster Fresh in recent years and back to Field Fresh, so it's had one or two name changes. They do red, um, red and brown onions today. That is the only product lines. Um, production is from seed to supermarket. In other words, they grow their own seed, um, run their own production base, but there is no land holding. It's all grown with growers on contract, uh, about a 140 kilometer radius from the base in Forth. And so they do all the drilling, all the agronomy services, all the harvesting, uh, bring the product in, pack it, market it, and export it under their own name. Approximately 40,000 tonnes a year of product, um, about 75% of Australian exports of onions and of that business approximately 60% goes to Europe principally Germany um, although smaller amounts to other European countries that percentage is probably declining slowly um, at 20% to Asia almost entirely Japan 
and 20% today is on the domestic market into Woolworths in Victoria, and that is a new venture for Field Fresh in the last six months. So that is really replacing some of the European market. So counter seasonal up into, into Northern Hemisphere and um, most of the season domestically. Field Fresh's business, Japan, started in the 1980s, I say really with Vcon, which was the original Gillum com company. Um, initially it was onions, and then added Kuroda carrots um, fairly quickly. And then over the years have looked at various other products going to Japan, but really come back down to onions. They stopped carrot production in 2010, although continue to market some Tasmanian carrots into the Japan market for a further year. Um, but it's onions today. Onions is the total focus of the business. Noko Fukuchi has been the field fresh representative in Japan for 27 years now. Um, quite unusual to get a lady in the produce business in Japan, and Noko being in the business for such a long time has been quite remarkable. She's in her uh, late 60s now, um, but very, very dedicated there, and, and that's something that I'll bring up later. The business is sold on a fixed forward price contract. In other words, agreement is made on price, shipping schedule, products all shipped in container, um, so there's a fair lead time to getting product there. And a, a program over a period. And the supply window is from mid-February arrivals to about the end of August, so it's quite a broad supply window. And principally, um, the supermarket business is the first part of that, and then some for processing later on in the window, although that can spread right through the window. So in terms of processing, what I mean, going to people for peeling, for then dicing and incorporating to food service or, or processed um, um, meal generation. Most of the product goes up and is repacked, although some product is packed in Tasmania for direct sale. I'll show you some pictures of that. In recent years, the volume's been more stable. It used to be very much a seasonal market up and down, but today it's much more stable than it was. Talk a little bit about my, my views of culture in terms of dealing with the people, and that's something that's quite important, I feel, to understanding how you supply the market. As you saw, Feel Fresh supply many countries across the world, and I've been involved in, in sourcing and supply to, to much of the world with vegetables over my time. It's quite unique, the Japanese culture. Um, it is very traditional, and, and Masa was talking about the age of the, the farmers, and I think that's quite influential within the trade. They are influenced by own production. There were some questions from the floor about that. And, and that has an impact on their expectations, both in terms of, of technical standards and in terms of supply to, to them. I made a little note about timekeeping. A, a little story, I, uh, the first, my first visit to, to Japan, I arrived at Narita Airport very early in the morning and uh, got my bus ticket to go to Yokohama, which was the, the, the instruction I had, and uh, got my ticket and went and found where the bus stop was, and uh, the ticket was 6.50 a.m., and I was a few minutes early, so I just nipped back in to, to, the, to the terminal, went back out again, 6.51, of course, the bus had gone. <laughs> I said to the guy, I I've got a ticket. He said, oh, yes, but your ticket is 6.50. You'll go and have to change it for another ticket, for the, for the 7.10 or whatever it was, so you must do that. However, Japanese visitors to here, and we've had many Japanese visitors over the years, all of a sudden, it seems to disappear. If you have a nine o'clock appointment to pick them up from the hotel, I suggest you go and get the paper before you go, because you'll be sat in reception a little while. <laughs> but you must be there for nine o'clock, but expect to wait a bit. And during the day, if you have a schedule, it'll just disappear. So, the technical expectations. Um, they want to apply their domestic understanding to 
overseas suppliers to import. So their farming is based on a lot of very small scale production. And as a result, they can't really grasp the larger scale production that, that we have in Australia. Uh, we had some visitors come last year from uh, a cooperative um, actually around the, the Narita Airport area. And there was a cooperative, there was 30,000 vegetable growers within this cooperative. And they all have tiny blocks. And as a result, they are very interested in, in things like spray drift. I've certainly had requests from them for pesticide um, information for all the surrounding paddocks, which can be quite difficult when you're dealing with individual growers. Um, but that type of information is sort of information they want. We have, in particular, the processors are probably more dedicated to it than the, the supermarket people. And they will come and, and um, want to take a picture and, a, and an aerial view and, and lay out the, the paddock with, a, with, a, with a, um, a compass. So, but that is because their own production, they have high risks of con cross-contamination, that sort of thing. So that is where it's coming from. The European originated field standards, global gap, um, and even fresh care today, generally not terribly recognised. Some of the top line people will start to recognise them, but they're generally not recognised. They do, however, love a government stamp standard. So, Tasmania, we have a, just a, a HACCP um, uh, certificate done each year as part of our accreditation, and it's signed by the Premier, and that goes down really well. So that type of thing is very different. Pesticides and residues are quite important. Um, you can find the Japanese MRLs on the internet. They're very easily to, easy to find. So you can find what the standards are, and they are different from Europe, and they're different from Australia. However, they're... From an onion point of view, they're not too difficult to achieve. Um, this rolls onto their food safety and environmental schemes for supermarkets. They have a quite unique scheme to, to me. When we're used to dealing with supermarkets in, in Europe where they're interested in pesticide residue because that's their, um, their media push that. And as a result, they're interested in lower rates, they're interested in extended withholding periods, um, really to reduce um, risk of residue. And they're also introduced, interested in the products that you apply in terms of operator environmental standards. So that would be the European expectation. For the, some of the supermarket schemes in Japan, they're looking at reduced input, same sort of thing. So they were looking for a standard input um, document, both in terms of pesticides and fertilisers, nitrogen fertilisers, and then a reduction of that to achieve a higher level premium product. So for fertilisers, they're looking at a reduction of, of typically 30% of, of nitrogen input, um, and that's fairly straightforward. For pesticides, though, they're not interested in the rate. They're not interested in the withholding period. What they're interested in is the number of applications of an active ingredient. So if you have a mixed product fungicide, say, with two components to get a, um, a spread of, of resistance management, that classifies as two. So the beginning of the year you have an allocation of so many active ingredient applications and you're looking to reduce the number of active ingredient applications. So if you have a fungicide that you've applied three times and it's got two components, that would count as six. doesn't matter what the rate is and particularly it's a problem with resistance management where you may be mixing something to get resistance management or using low dose um, herbicides to a number of things to spread the activity. So, but the, the requirement is quite significant in the reduction. Again, they're looking for 30 to 50% of the active ingredient reduction. So 
it's quite difficult to get your head around it, but it's, 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 a, it's a very different scheme. They're quite tough on quarantine and physical contamination. Um, so quarantine requirements would be very similar to Australia. We have to produce five sanitary certificates. Um, and certain places would be more stringent on, on um, inspection than others. So some ports would be more stringent than others. Um, there's always one port in, in uh, Japan that we get a, a complaint about thrip, and the product has to, be, has to be fumigated, but only ever one port. Um, physical contamination, again, can be quite uh, something they get quite excited about. Uh, another little story, I had a, a complaint come through with pictures from a processor, and they were claiming that there was um, shotgun pellets in the onions. Fairly serious, I agreed with that. They couldn't actually tell me the exact trace, and been, they could only tell me the container, which had got a number of crop lines in. Anyway, they sent the pictures, and the pictures weren't really very clear, so I asked them to send the, the, um, the units, the, the, the items through. They said, would you like us to, to send them through? Yes, yes, put them in the post. Didn't arrive, and uh, our uh, representative actually got them back again, and then she sent them again, she thought, strange. Quarantine in Melbourne post office had impounded them. They were actually seeds. And I got in awful trouble because we were receiving imported seeds from Japan. So, um, organoleptic testing, taste testing, um, something again that they're far more interested in than, than many places in the world. So, we had some visitors uh, back this season who were. Uh, uh, wanted to go through a number of different crops, a number of different varieties, and were tasting raw onion. And uh, that's hard work after a time. In terms of supply expectations, they quite like to see their own crop. Now, their own crop is in a field fresh sense where there is about 70 different crops. Um, and each market wants a different size, quite difficult, and a long marketing season. But if you can show a crop, and yes, you can have from that crop, that's great. Programs and order changes can be difficult. Um, not quite like supplying a domestic supermarket. However, in terms of an export with a long lead time, it's quite tricky at times. Feel Fresh have a system where the customers can see the orders online um, and the shipping schedule. And we actually changed the way that was reported because it used to be ex-Melbourne and, and everybody um, from Tasmania would perhaps understand we have a, a feed of vessel across, everything goes through Melbourne these days. Um, and it takes two or three days lead time just to get it to Melbourne and you always have to be there one day before the ship arrives, the international ship. This is about a five to six day lead time from the pack house to actually the ship departing, the international ship departing. We used to report the international ship departure date, but they would try to change the order up to the day before the international ship departure date was, but we couldn't do it because there's a lead time getting across Bass Strait. So we then had to change the system so that it displayed it from departure Devonport. Um, so. There's a lot of chopping and changing, and you'll find that the, say everything's shipped, it goes into multiple ports in Japan. Um, the quite Unlike Europe, where generally speaking there are only three or four ports of entry to countries, in Japan there are many ports, and sub-feeder ports as well. And you'll find the orders get changed from one port to another quite frequently, and that can be an issue with shipping. So that's the multiple destination. They love counting everything. Absolutely love it. Everything is sold by a unit, and the unit is nearly everything goes in 20 kilo nets, and the unit is a 20 kilo net. Everything's priced in 20 kilo net, and they get very frustrated if the order says 62 20 kilo nets on the pallet and the 61. Feel fresh have automatic palletizers, and they don't always count perfectly, and and very frustrated like that. So sold by count need to know that you deliver the count because it will be counted. Generally speaking, payments 
and claims would be very good. Um, no real issue with payments there. Generally, they're very good about paying. They will claim potentially uh, if the product really isn't very good, but generally speaking, in comparison with the European market, bearing in mind that in terms of onion, it's only paid for when it's packed at the other end. You don't get you, you get a price related to the tonnage that's packed out generally. That there's an expectation of some loss, um, but the claim level in Japan was generally pretty good. So, in terms of comparison with the, dealing with the Europeans, not so much an issue. Just going to showing you a few pictures about uh, about production there. This is actually Field Fresh's packing line. Um, the main feed comes in over the far side here. Product is stored actually in 20 foot containers. Um, comes through three feed hoppers, over three toppers, up and over a um, big size grader here, um, two 1800 millimeter wide sizes, and out on 11 grading tables. And then beyond here goes into various forms of packaging, um, much of which is automated. Average throughput 30 tonnes an hour across a week, spot throughput 50 to 60 tonnes an hour. Um, very high capacity, automated line as much as possible. You know, high costs of labour, we know all about that. A lot of investment gone in there in the last three years to try to reduce the labour costs associated with it. That's the feed, feed for a Japan packing line. So we have a 20 kilos nets here that Field Fresh have supplied. Um, and the guy cuts the tops of them and tips them into the line. So a slightly different thing. And this is a developed pack house. So it is stainless steel, yes. Um, and this is a, a, a far more developed than some others. That's the labelling crew. So the nets come here in, in, in bunches. So they're a, a, a woven plastic net with actually a heat sealed bottom, um, an open top, and uh, they have a clear plastic patch on them. And the ladies peel the labels, the labels off a roll and stick them to the patches. So I don't know how many ladies there are there. Quite a few, and that was they were labelling labeling the nets for the next day to run. This pack house actually does have some uh, machinery in here. Uh, you can see these tubes coming down. These are multi-head wires at the top. I'll show you on the next picture. The product comes down the tube here. These are the nets that the ladies have, have labelled with a sticker on. And these ladies hold the tube over the net and catch the onion. It is coming from a multi-head, and everything's using that to count to a certain extent, but they, they then check the weight. So it's sold by count number, to, in case of red onions, two in a net, um, but it has to reach minimum weight as well. So that's why this lady checks it on the scales, and if necessary, takes a small one out, put a big one in, or takes a big one out, put a small one in. They then put on the side here, and uh, another person there puts them through a clipping machine by hand to put a plastic clip around the top. This is another pack house. Sorry, the previous pack house was, was actually Master's pack house. Um, this is another pack house for, for a, a major international multiple that has a Japanese operation. Here, the nets of onions are tipped out into a into a, a round into a into a, a, a wooden box, in effect. And the ladies pick them up by hand, clean them up, and put them in a net and put them on the side there. Uh, sorry, there was actually a plastic bag rather than net. Same same principle. And then this lady clips the tops and puts them in the supermarket dispatch tray. Totally by hand. Massa was, Massa was saying about labelling. Um, you can see here Tasmanian onion. So they do promote the labelling. 
um, another different pack. Um, again, this is the, the three brown onions in a, in a net, a plastic clip at the top, very neatly finished. Everything has to sit perfectly and they're packed to perfection all the time. Everything looks very neat and very tight. Feel Fresh do supply some product direct into Japan, ready for supermarket. So this is Costco, Japan, quite significant in Japan, Costco are. Um, and they're supplying uh, ready for store. So this is going straight into DC. Um, shipped reefer though, rather than dry, whereas all on other onions are shipped dry. But this is actually shipped reefer. It goes straight into DC in Tokyo. Um, the, the, the bins are not actually filled up like that. They chuck a few on top. Um, but it, it is a branded um, octobin, uh, 550 kilos, 110 by 5 kilo packs inside of it, um, barcoded up for, for the tills. So done direct. There's been quite a lot of interest from the, from the other supermarkets about packing, direct, packing at source as well. Uh, far more difficult to, to do when you're talking about small packs and that small packing format there really doesn't lend itself to automation. So that's a difficulty there. As I said about branding as well, this is, this is a picture of can't really see a picture of me with one of Field Fresh's harvesters. Um, so that is on a store display in a, in a store over the onions here. So they are promoted in store. Just in summary, their frustrating attention to some detail is quite important and you just have to work with that and accept that. Um, I say some detail because some things just don't seem to be there in comparison with many other, many other um, countries that the business supplies. But things like making sure the product is counted is very, very important. The market is traditional, we talked about that. The, generally speaking, the customers are very loyal they're not driven totally by price. It is not a supermarket culture where it's lowest price. They, they do have a long loyalty and Feel Fresh has had many, many years of relationship with many of the customers there. In our view, you need a Japan-based agent or representative. I think if you're going to be serious about it, you need somebody based there. The language is a, is a problem otherwise and being in the in the supply um, chain there is quite important. Yes, they're unique. I, I've say again that in comparison with, certainly with Europe, even with supplying other countries in Southeast Asia, which are more European and more market driven, um, they are unique. Oh yeah, and when you have got them from the airport, you only get 500 metres up the road and they've all gone to sleep in the back of the car anyway. <laughs> so, don't worry about that on a tour. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, it's uh, Nick Meyer from Organic Farmgate. Uh, you just mentioned packing, uh, interest for packing at source. What's the driver behind that for the, for the customers? I, I assume it's, it's driven by um, cost recovery. And obviously, as you can see, their own packing, although labour rates, rural labour rates, where most of the packing houses are, are pretty low, um, you'd actually see most of the ladies there and their working would be older as well. Um, but it's driven by price at the end of the day, yeah, They're trying, to get, trying to get a cheaper product into the market. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.